This month, a personal Everest for thousands saw the Fastnet race break its own record this year. Plus, what the world's top professional racers do on their week off. And a beast of a boat hits the water. But first, Cow's Week. Big boats and big trophies. How a 14-year-old stole the show. And why a 78-year-old boat is still ahead of her time. Sunshine, gales, calm, tide, waves, big boats, small boats, fast boats, slow boats, young, old, and an impressive new record. The world's most famous regatta had it all. And with 8,000 sailors aboard 700 boats in 38 classes, there was plenty to talk about at Lendy Cows Week starting with the newest addition to the event. The Seven Star Triple Crown Series offered three days of racing for three historic trophies for the biggest boats in the fleet. Plus, a new Duke of Edinburgh Triple Crown trophy from the Royal Collection for the overall winner. With the breeze up, the race around the Isle of Wight was the big one as the seven-strong Volvo Ocean Race fleet joined in. This was the first time that the teams had faced each other. With limited opportunities to practice before the start of their round-the-world race in October, there was already plenty at stake in this first stage of leg zero. It's a little short-term lull here. Doing good, but it's busy. Close racing was assured, but few were expecting records to be broken including the team that set a new pace and sliced 36 minutes off the previous best. It was windy up there in the, in the south part of the island and we had to push the boat quite strongly. And the start was super important. We did a very good start and then one tack in the middle where we tacked right in the, in the perfect place and we stretched a little bit there. And then, you know, it's reaching and then fractional and then one jiving and all went very well. Hot foot from a cup victory in Bermuda. The record was also a great start for one of the team's newest recruits. A lot of people are stepping out of the cup stuff, out of you know Olympic class boats into this, and you know you've got to be able to make the boat go fast, whether it's trimming the sails or, or driving the boat. So there's that element to it, but then you know not not it's not for everyone. And I'm hoping that you know the whole endurance part of it and just being able to push the boat day in day out is going to be um, you know something that I'll be good at, and um, you know that we can just keep pushing hard for the the whole leg and then each leg into the next one and for the whole race. Big Thursday swept through the next day as the weather ramped up. All but two classes were cancelled. It was pretty uh, pretty lively, you know, we saw 40 knots, uh, we saw 40 knot knots out there. And we were sailing mostly in 25 to 35, so we started in quite, quite lumpy water there and we stabilised into the, into the flatter water just off the harbour there and, uh, and then got, got it in the air and, uh, and off we went. <laughs> We've seen 25 knots downwind. Three days of racing had delivered three separate victories, along with the event's first overall winner. Quite a breezy end to the day and uh, really glad we made it back in one piece to actually collect the trophies. But <laughs> yeah, no, it was uh, really great fun. But the week wasn't just about seasoned pros. Youth sailing was out in force. I'm Harry and I do navigation and fourth man. I'm Ollie and I'm skipper. I'm Ted, I do main trim. I'm Will and I do bow and jib trim. We're sailing an etchels. Um, there's four of us sailing it together. And yeah, we're competing against all the older blokes. So we're the youngest team there. We went to an event a few months ago, uh, a youth trials and we we did well in that event and won uh, the use of a boat for a year, which was kindly donated by David Franks and uh, sponsored by the Royal London Yacht Club. There's a trophy you can win if uh, you have the best set of results for a team that's under 25. So obviously we're, we are in the lower age limit, being all 18 or 19, so we have a few more years to do that. But we're getting on all right. I think we're about third or fourth in that so far, so if we keep keep increasing our results. We're getting better as the week goes on, so hopefully we'll get up there. 
but one young sailor stole the show. 14-year-old Freddie Peters cleaned up at Cowes, taking him and his father, who was crewing for him, by surprise. Massive, huge. <laughs> Did not expect it at all. First time in the boat. I might have sailed it around when I was a lot younger with Dad, but not that I remember. Windy, wavy, choppy, <laughs> tidal. But it's been a big learning curve and hugely important. He did incredibly well. He kept uh, calm and clear. There were obviously loads of boats around, and they're not that easy to, to steer, but he did much better than I expected. We had my daughter and a friend of hers who did all the navigation, so we knew where we were, we knew where the marks were. I did quite a lot of the tactics, but when you get boats on boat, it's got to be him that makes the decisions, and he did it very, very well. Yet for all the talent and technology on the race course, when it came to winning Lendy Cow's Week overall, the biggest trophy went to a 78-year-old boat. She was uh, designed in 1937, designed by Lauren Giles of Leamington, and she was designed as a very shallow draft boat, and he was, took a complete punt as far as hull shape and designed something really, really wide for that time because she had no stability from ballast, and all the stability was supposed to come from the shape. And uh, 78 years later, it turns out to be, I would say, possibly ahead of many of the brand new boats that go in the water now. We bought Whooper as a boat we thought she'd be perfect for pottering around in the Solent. And gradually we realized the potential she had and we got into racing more and more. But not for one minute we thought we could beat uh, the kind of fleet that you get for Cowswick, you know? It's incredible we got there. It was only a matter of time before the America's Cup winning helmsman was snapped up. But Peter Burling's next challenge will take him into unfamiliar territory as he heads offshore. The 26-year-old multiple world champion, double Olympic medalist and now America's Cup holder has joined Team Brunel for the next edition of the Volvo Ocean Race. I've done a little bit of ocean racing but um, still got a lot to learn obviously and I'm really looking forward to the challenge. No, I only really made my decision you know, pretty, pretty recently and uh, but it's something that you know, I've always wanted to do this race. His longtime crew in the 49er and former cup teammate Blair Tuke had already been signed up by Mapfrey for the same race. Four multi-hulls versus an ocean liner. The Queen Mary II raced across the Atlantic to commemorate 100 years since the arrival of US troops on the French coast during World War I. With the weather forecast we have now, we know that we won't be able to go faster than the Queen Mary, but it will be a nice way uh, to symbolize the bridge and what we could do between France and uh, America. The multi-hulls were indeed no match for the elegant liner in the crossing from Saint-Nazaire in France to New York. Yet Gabar's pace aboard Massif was impressive, completing the 3,500-mile trip in eight days. Just over two days behind the Queen Mary II. Closer to the shore, but still in the multi-hull world, Oman Air currently leads the Extreme Sailing Series after back-to-back -back wins in Barcelona and Hamburg. But success didn't come easily. Having led from the start of the Hamburg event, Phil Robertson's crew saw their advantage whittled away on the last day to a single point. Oman Air, not used to losing. However, Phil Robertson has been forced to work very hard for every game. Checking and deploy. SAP Extreme Sailing Team won the final race, but the Oman Air crew finished second to win the event and take the overall series lead. Last two days we've had, I think, 16 races. The boys have dug super deep and we've come away with the goods, so happy days. It's a tiny race boat with a big pull that the world's top sailors cannot resist. As soon as the America's Cup was over, the sailing world's rock stars were heading to Italy. Oh, I, I keep coming back just because it's really fun. You know, the racing's really tight and, and really, really fast and high intensity. Uh, the boats are right on the cutting edge of technology. You're sailing a boat that's 11 foot long and you're doing 30 knots downwind. It's a great class to be involved with and it's a lot of fun. I think everyone has a bit of a love-hate relationship with their moth. Um, such cool boats to sail and they go so fast and be very rewarding when you sail it well but every week you go sailing you break quite a bit of stuff as well and you know from a foiling AC50 to a little 12 foot foiling moth um, they're pretty similar yet quite different. 
and they were all here for one thing, the coveted world title. And we are racing, looks like a clean start. The 240 boat fleet was the biggest in the history of the class. Race one, the Moth World 2017, and Benny Payton is leading this fleet quite comfortably. Good form there from the Paytonator. The opening rounds took some of the big dogs by surprise as the pressure started to build. He's led for the whole race. Can he handle the pressure? No, he can't! But Artemis Racing's Paul Goodison could and was out to prove a point. Even current America's Cup winner and former Moth champion Peter Burling couldn't quite match the leader's pace. Behind him, other rock stars had muscled their way to the front of the fleet. Jensen, Slingsby, Burling and Outeridge were locking horns. But Goodison was way ahead on points. He held on to his lead and his title for a second consecutive time. The first person to do so in the class. The racing's been incredible with so many good guys up there and uh, I think it just made some good decisions each day, uh, raced pretty well and obviously got quite good speed so uh, really, really happy to come away with, uh, with winning the Worlds. With two races spare, was, uh, I couldn't dream of such happening so, so super happy. Coming up next, the world's biggest offshore race got bigger once again. But who came out on top? Welcome back. Still to come, how a single yacht might change the future. But first, it's the biggest offshore race in the world and has become a must-do event for many. And this year, they turned up to the legendary Fastnet race in record numbers. It took just four minutes and 24 seconds for the 2017 Rolex Fastnet race to sell out. Eight months later, another record was set as 362 boats started the 605 nautical mile classic from Cowes. The biggest fleet in the history of the event. At 115 feet long, Nakata was the largest, the 100-footer CQS the most extreme, and the 70-foot trimaran can size 10 likely to be the fastest. Meanwhile, Rambler 88 was gunning for line honors in the monohulls, and the Volvo Ocean Race crews were eyeing each other up. One minute. Here we go, boys, warm it up. 15 still. 15. Back to here. Their fast net was the second stage of Leg Zero, the prologue to the Volvo Ocean Race, and the pressure was building. This is what this is all about, this is why we do this. Elsewhere, the double-handed fleet was bigger than ever, spearheaded by professional crews aboard their Imoka 60s. Hot on their heels, a large fleet of Class 40s were competing in the penultimate race of their season's championship. Series leader Phil Sharp was well aware of the pressure. A race course like the Fastnet offers you everything. I mean, I think it's fair to say we'll have everything between calms and, and heavy weather, uh, if it's anything to go by previous editions. There's a, a really big turnout in the Class 40 fleet, bigger than ever before, so it's going to be very intense, very exciting racing. And I think it's going to be all to play for at the front of the fleet. There's going to be several boats, uh, actually slightly newer than our boats as well, that are going to be challenging us. Yet the bulk of the fleet remained Corinthian. From crews focused on the silverware to those realizing a personal ambition. Professionals alongside amateurs. Each had their own agenda in this legendary race. Despite perfect conditions for the start, a forecast for light weather meant that a new race record was unlikely to be set. But this didn't stop Concise firing out of the Solent. In that breeze with that many people around, it takes a little bit to sail the thing, but um, yeah, we thought we'd pick a lane between the, between the other multis and pop the hull in there. That was our soft. In just 29 hours, they'd reached the Fastnet Rock and were turning for home. Behind them, George David's Rambler 88 was halfway across the Celtic Sea with CQS and Nikata chasing hard. Close astern, Paul Mayer's Imoka 60 SMA was on a roll 
and had stolen a march on the double-handed pack. Then came the Volvo 65s, locked in a seven-way battle. By the time they got to the rock, it was Dong Fung that rounded in the lead, with Matt Frey hot on their tail. Meanwhile, Concise 10 was charging back to the finish to take line honours. Yeah, we stormed back from the rock, we really did. Um, again, 20, 25 knots of pressure and um, had all the sails up and um, working the boys pretty hard. Um, sort of the little bit of sea state that we found sort of working down the waves, but um, yeah, honestly the boat sat there in high, uh, well, high 20s, low 30s and um, just, just, just shoes, miles. You really, really can't believe it. She's actually keep checking the speedo and the thing's doing 25, 27 knots and um, just in that flat water, it's just effortless, it's absolutely effortless. As Concise Turn crossed the line in Plymouth, 43 hours after starting, the nearest boat was over 200 miles behind. Yet Rambler 88 was still leading the monohulls with one goal in mind. We wanted to get line honours. I wanted that in 20, in 2007, and in 11, and in 15, and in 17, and we missed it. We were bridesmaids the first three times, and this time we actually got here first. Behind them, CQS crossed the line almost five hours later, followed shortly by Nakata. And then came the charge of the Volvo 65s, as the entire fleet finished within 39 minutes after more than 600 miles of racing. Crossing the line first, Dong Fung was just 56 seconds ahead of Matt Frey after a neck and neck race home. Unfortunately, the Volvo will be like that. It was really difficult to, to be ahead and to stay ahead. You know, he lost the lead many times and come back, and there was many, many leaders. Axo and Malfre said it pretty well. It was really difficult to, to fight against them. But, and the last day was really, really complicated. Big clouds everywhere, big shift of wind, and we passed from first to last and come back to first. In the class 40s, the racing was also tight. Phil Sharp's crew had been locked in a private battle at the front of the fleet. Final warning of the fast nets. There's uh, 25 knots reaching to Cape Lizard and to the finish. We got a bit of a shock this morning. There was B and B in front of us, and they just start pulling out from us in their ideal condition. So not a lot we can do at the moment. Victory went down to the wire with Maxime Sorel's V and B taking the lead at the finish. During the, the last night, with uh, more wind, uh, we passed the, the second and the, and the first, and uh, it's the first victory of this boat. We are very happy to finish uh, first uh, in front of Phil Sharp, yeah. But while the big guns were ashore, there was a feeling that the race still wasn't yet over. I think it will be a smaller boat race until we'll have more wind, but uh, we'll wait till tomorrow. There'll be more wind tomorrow, and, that, and the boats that are out there will just have you know, a great percentage of wind than we had, so I've just got to think that they're going to dominate the race. Uh, but how do you know? Just wait and see. Wait till the stopwatch is stopped. And when it did, the predictions were right. As Didier Gordou's 39-foot LAN L2 won the 2017 Rolex Fastnet race on corrected time. We have uh, fantastic condition all the time but it was quite intense on the boat. I think we, we did a good start, but not uh, exceptional. Really, the boat is designed to be extremely good on downwind, and it was uh, big waves and uh, quite nice wind, so we did very well. And uh, to win the Fastnet is an old dream <laughs> okay, that I had when I was a, a young sailor. It's a great achievement, and I'm very happy to it. The 2017 Rolex Fastnet race will go down as another classic edition. And while it took no time to sell out, the memories for some will last for a lifetime. Rarely does a single yacht change the future of sailing. But as the doors slid open on the Multiplast Yard in France, the first clues appeared as to how long distance, high speed offshore racing might be transformed. Gitana 17 is 32 metres long, 23 metres wide, and weighs just 15 tonnes. She's a monster, whichever way you look at her, but she is unique in her class because she's designed to fly. And as she headed to Lorient to have her custom-built carbon mast stepped, that day was getting closer. Guillaume Verdier leads the design team that created her. 
As one of the key designers behind Emirates Team New Zealand's groundbreaking foiling catamaran for the 2013 America's Cup, he has plenty of experience to draw upon. Even so, the goal to make Gitana fly wasn't simple. The latest America's Cup is slightly different because we push so much the electronic side of things that we went to the most unstable for it, the most crazy to drive, the most difficult object to handle. But it's not what we do here. We saw with Team New Zealand that the SC-70 twin wave was very epic, very difficult and uh, very dangerous probably. And then we tried on the Mod 70 that uh, Gitana had to, to make it foiling. Uh, so we built different type of foils. We, we put the elevator on a rudder that brought a lot of stability. And uh, step after step, we managed to go into two meter waves and, and be more or less stable. And then we introduced the, the big elevator under the dagger board. And then we realized we need a stiff platform. Uh, the, the freeboard raised, the beams got really uh, massive. Uh, the weight increased a little bit. Yeah, giant multi-hulls such as Spindrift, Massif and Sodebo are already notoriously quick. So why the move to foils? Skipper Sebastian Joss explains. When we fly, you have less drag, so you go faster off one or two, three knots. 35 knots, it looks a red speed. Uh, we can go 40 knots, I think. Foils, it's uh, more comfortable. You are like uh, in the air, so it's less movement for the sails. It's more stable. And after, it gives you the opportunity to catch another weather system. When you're in the train wind, if you go 20% faster, maybe you can catch a low pressure for the South Ocean and, uh, and, you, and you all go forward. And when you come back in the Atlantic, it's the same. So flying is not all the time. It's some time to catch a good weather system, to stay with this weather system. First to catch it and after to stay with the system. So it's for that foils, I think it's the future for offshore sailing. So while it may be rare for one boat to change the sailing world, there are plenty already watching Gitana 17 to see if she does. Next month, how a team of teenagers with no previous sailing experience took on the biggest offshore race in the world. Plus, what's under the skin of the latest breed of carbon 40-foot races?